Welcome back. Our next guest is Pascal Blum. I'm really looking forward to this conversation because I know Pascal from university and followed his endeavors since then. What he has created with UNO is outstanding and I'm sure that this is just the beginning. Pascal Blum is the founder and CEO of UNO, the electric scooter pioneer headquartered in Berlin. Pascal is a true pioneer. Already in 2016, he forecasted that electrical shared and connected mobility for city mobility will be the future. UNO raised to date more than 40 million euros in venture capital and last year has launched the second product, UNO Scooter, a complete new platform built from scratch. In his own words, in the past two years, we have gone through all challenges a hardware product company can go through. And therefore, I'm sure we will learn a lot from this conversation. Before we jump into the conversation, we will show you the new UNO Scooter. Nice, Pascal. Uh, people love the soundtrack. Me too. I think it really um, reflects the vibe of Berlin. Really cool. And Pascal, you really made, made scooters sexy again. I think that's a great accomplishment and uh, solves a lot of the um, traffic jams uh, we have in, in German cities. Um, yeah. So congrats to that. And Pascal, we talked um, a few days ago and uh, realized crazy times, right, for you guys from Corona to sewers to chip shortage. I mean, is there anything that can shock you now? And how do you deal with all those setbacks? Um, no, I think the last two years uh, have been have been definitely challenging for every hardware company. Um, but uh, actually, I think there's also the times, you know, where uh, you really learn how to manage um, in a wartime uh, and uh, how to really focus on the solutions of, of current challenges. Um, and you build certain resilience. Um, and I think um, looking back, I think I personally, but also uh, we in the in the team, we learned a lot um, and we're really looking uh, that we can apply that also in times that, uh, yeah, don't constantly come up with new new challenges around the corner, but also uh, where we're getting back to, norma uh, to normality uh, and can really um, scale the company further um, and scale our um, entire supply chain accordingly. Hmm. Yeah, Pascal, uh, we have uh, studied business and economics together at uh, the beautiful Lake of Constance. How did you actually end up leading a hardware company? And also, were you aware of the the, stellar, the challenges of starting a hardware business? Yeah, so, um, I mean, we both studied at a university that didn't have any uh, technical departments. Um, so I think uh, uh, we, we only, you know, learned half of, of, of what you need. Uh, to actually uh, start such a company, um, but that was actually one of the reasons why it was clear for me from the start um, that I need, you know, a great founding team. Um, and I found that with with Elias and with Mathieu, who both studied uh, actually at the Technical U University in Munich, uh, that had also already quite some experience in the e-mobility space. Um, and so I think without them, I would have never uh, started such a company because I have a lot of respect uh, for. Uh, for hardware as a business, um, and I think that that is um, still true that you know hardware is hard, and uh, mm -hmm. so therefore um, I think it was the right choice to to uh, start with you know technology co uh, co-founders. 
All right. And what do you, what would you say is the biggest challenges, the two or three biggest challenges for hardware companies? Yeah, I think, um, um, I mean, money is always not a big topic uh, because um, on the one hand side, um, especially in, uh, I mean, in Europe, but I think it's, it's actually a global phenomenon. Obviously, the typical uh, venture, uh, you know, um, venture capitalists, they tend to rather focus on software investments. Um, and so therefore you have a hard time on the one hand side to get money um, but at the same time in contrast to a software business you really require a lot of money and um, we've mm -hmm. learned that in the past also that often uh, you even if you think you know hey this could be a cheap solution it's cheap in the beginning uh, but then you end up paying actually much more um, and um, so therefore I think money um, is, is always a big problem um, for scaling a hardware business um, and then um, the second thing is really managing complexity. Um, for like, I think this became really evident in the last two years. We have a global supply chain. You know, we produce in Asia, um, but we our new product consists of you know parts from over 200 sub suppliers, and these are even have you know a couple of hundred more, <laughs> if not a thousand. Um, and so, you know, for example, you mentioned the chip crisis. We're constantly right now running behind uh, certain chips that we never really you know, uh, were experts in because they're just a tiny little part of, of the electronics components that we're building. Um, but um, without them, there's no scooter. You know? um, and so it's a bit different, I think, to a lot of other um, scale-up or, or also startup companies where you once you have you know, tackled the, the basics of your business model, you can really focus on, on scaling, um, but with less complexity. Yeah. I mean, you, you're actually facing the same problem uh, as uh, Volkswagen. Uh, I, today I read that uh, they cannot build 100,000 vehicles uh, this next six weeks, six weeks because of the chip shortage. So it's uh, no matter what size you face the same uh, problems and you're basically competing against VW in those chip markets, right? That's really interesting. But let's talk, let's stick uh, with money. And you told me if the first version of the scooter it's uh, the Uno Classic, I think, uh, was built with five people and 250k uh, of, of um, in in the first basically investment, and then the second was by factor 100 more expensive when you just take the uh, the funding uh, you have received. So, can you tell us a little bit about the the development process of the first um, uh, Uno scooter and then of the second Uno scooter? So that we understand what you have done basically, and what learnings you 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 got um, in in basically from the first to the second one. Sure. Um, so the first one um, was like a pure MVP approach. Uh, so we you know had this idea of um, creating an urban mobility company um, that does a direct sales business model um, and develops a beautiful lightweight uh, electric scooter. Uh, with easy and portable batteries. Um, so that was the base concept when we started the company um, to connect people with their city. And uh, it was clear to us, you know, we started this out of university, funds will be a problem. Um, so we take an MVP approach. Um, this meant we took an existing uh, petrol scooter, um, mm -hmm. similar to Tesla, um, what they did with the Tesla Roadster, the original one, where they used the chassis of the Lotus Elise. And so we used that one and basically, you know, focus really on the first lightweight um, electrical, uh, sorry, battery um, concept, uh, electrical engine uh, drive components, um, and then, you know, basically only use already existing parts that were off the shelf. Um, and with that product, um, with five people and I think one and a half years of development time, we were actually able to launch a product in the market. And from then we have, you know, basically then worked in two streams. On the Scooter Classic, we had like two facelifts um, that kind of, you know, solved, for example, quality issues that we found in the field or small improvements that we found. Um, but since we are direct to consumer business, we, um, you know, get a lot of data from our customers and why they love the product, why they don't love the product, mm -hmm. why they bought it, why they don't buy it. Um, and we collect all of that. Um, and then it was very clear um, after a short amount of time you know, to to really build a great product in this market that can also outstand the competition, we have to start, you know, from scratch. We cannot build it based on a petrol scooter. Um, and this is basically everything that happened then with the second generation. We started with a blank sheet of paper 
uh, we leveraged all the information that we had about the users um, and, and kind of defined kind of the ideal um, electric uh, moped or scooter for the city. And then we went all in and, and uh, on that journey, uh, what we found is really, you know, um, there's a completely different ball game um, than, you know, using an existing chassis and just adapting a few components. Um, so that was a way, way more complex um, development process. Mm -hmm. So talking about the development process, uh, did you have a, a, a hardware product development process lined up or like did you draw something to say, okay, this is, these are my five, six steps in the hardware development process? Uh, like how did you organize this a little bit? Because like my question hints to the, um, the fact that uh, we have Sod Mayer, he who will also speak um, in two hours or one and a half hours about the uh, phase gate approach. And I'm interested if you are using such an approach or like if it was not uh, as structured as, as such an approach. Yeah, uh, so, so I mean, the, the, as we were in the beginning, a very small team with, let's say, not the, the strongest automotive background, I think in the early days of the development process it was uh, still very hectic and chaotic and, and actually we were missing um, a certain approach. Um, but after a while actually, uh, what worked best for us uh, was that for the for the hardware uh, we followed like a standard uh, you know automotive uh, development uh, approach with different gates um, and on the uh, on the on the software side um, work in a really agile uh, work mode mm -hmm. and I have to say this also was not ideal uh, because you have basically two streams that are uh, working in a completely different methodology. Um, however, they are still extremely depending on each other, um, and um, I think, but right, like so, so where we are now, so once we have the space with the new scooter, uh, we are actually now in a much more um, agile work mode, both on the hardware as well as on the software. It was, uh, I think, this this automotive approach was needed to get once this you know base platform out mm -hmm. there. Like a fully working scooter with full, you know, connectivity in it, um, but everything that we're doing around this product now is really more iteratively, and we can, similar also to Tesla, you know, launch certain hardware upgrade uh, updates um, once they are ready, uh, and we don't have to funnel everything to through one um, gate at one point in time. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe quickly explain the 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 the, the this hardware um, uh, this automotive um, development process? How, how how does it look like? Uh, just give us a sense of how this looks like and what are the uh, did you, did you have like uh, regular meetings or did you have meetings every quarter? Like uh, like how does this work in practice? I mean, you, you actually there, you work really more with a waterfall approach, um, obviously prototype phase and then TVT, PVT phase, mm -hmm. etc. So, you know, um, yeah. from, from concept phase, prototyping phase, design yeah. validation phase, uh, product validation phase, then to the end, end product. Um, and I mean, since, since we are still a small company, um, you know, our communication is rather fast. So if we have, at least a weekly meeting um, mm -hmm. per team, um, but basically day, daily daily communication. Um, and these streams are being managed by product managers. Um, so um, they are basically, you know, basically get like clearing out what's the priority. Um, they are, um, you know, giving out the um, basically the task for 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 the engineering, the, the design team, mm. etc. But they are also making sure that you know this machine basically works hand in hand, and and um, that in the end, you know, um, we don't only have a working scooter, but a scooter that is beautiful in its design and has a great user experience because that is a key differentiator for us. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you uh, you really built this from scratch, I believe. And there, there was also a, a question from Zod here in the chat of how much did you leverage um, existing products or mopeds uh, in the market that were already in the market? Like, how did you um, did you use a platform already? Or I believe probably in the from from Bosch a little bit from the um, uh, electrical uh, powertrain or like how 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 did you? go about this um, yeah 
So, so I mean, we didn't for the new product. We really didn't use like the platform uh, per se, um, but we were very selective on on the component level. Uh, what do we want to build, you know, in house? What do we want to um, obviously leverage um, from from strong suppliers? Um, but what was clear from the start, for example, for the new product, um, was that the the base um, architecture has to come from us because there. I mean, you know, we don't want to have a nice version of this, I don't know, Chinese or Italian scooter. Mm -hmm. um, we really want to stand out from the market. And um, for example, one key thing that you just cannot change um, um, is um, the, the the base concept of the scooter is um, designed around usability um, and is designed around, you know, for example, the storage space. Like we have a lot of customers that have sold their car and now use our product as their mm. as their main uh, main vehicle in the city. So everything was designed around making the storage space as big as possible. And there's still today no other scooter with a similar um, you know storage space capacity. And this is one of the you know topics where we can really send out because electrical scooters nowadays come often with portable batteries. Those are basically in the storage space, and therefore. The storage space compartment is usually really small. Um, mm -hmm. For example, in our first product, if you had two batteries, you could literally not put anything else in there, maybe a tiny sheet of paper, uh, <laughs> but nothing more than that. In our new scooter, you know, you can have two helmets in there, you can have multiple shopping bags in there, you can put your suitcase uh, on the top, on the front. Um, so it's much, much more usable. But mm -hmm. to get there, we need to really, uh, like basically to design our entire own frame. And then, for example, when it comes to the design, it's also clear there's a differentiator. So we designed all the, the lights, the entire exterior, everything ourselves. But you mentioned, for example, Bosch. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, since we are not a high performance brand, so, you know, since we're in this urban vehicle category, mm -hmm. we don't have to have the fastest scooter in the world with the craziest acceleration. So the, the, the engine and controller, therefore, can come from Bosch. Um, mm -hmm. And also when it comes to the cell technology, since we want to be accessible, you know, we're not the ones that have the craziest te battery technology out there, but we try to leverage the best cells um, and that are, you know, still having a good price performance ratio. And so therefore we are working here with LG. Um, but another thing, for example, um, where we said, okay, we have to do this ourselves is the entire electronics and IoT part. Uh, because this product has to be seamlessly integrated with your phone, um, has a great display, and there's nothing else on the market that is, you know, um, comparable. And so the entire electronics um, and the software that it's running on it um, has been designed in-house. Mm. Um, and this is also something we want to use and leverage for, for example, future products, um, whether it's in the scooter market or maybe in the bike market or, or well, mm. somewhere else. Yeah, that's, I mean, super interesting. And I also saw that you have over-the-air update even before uh, a company like Volkswagen has, has it. I think they will launch it in August, uh, will be the first over-the-air update uh, for their um, new electrical platform. And uh, I think you have launched the, the, the scooter one and a half years before that or two years before that. So, I mean, it's from that perspective also, um, uh, uh, we we see what kind of a big challenge you actually uh, were facing. Uh, were you aware of that, um, or did you underestimate the supply chain and manufacturing part of it uh, a little bit? Uh, and I how, can say you know, necessarily a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think if we would have known uh, what it takes to get this through, uh, mm -hmm. we we I don't know if we would have uh, if we would have you know really started this. Mm -hmm. uh, but now looking back, we're obviously super happy. Um, but uh, yeah, we completely, I would say, um, were, we were underestimating the complexity that comes from all these tiny innovations because um, the first product was just leveraging so many, you know, um, off the shelf parts that each part that you do yourself, and especially if it's not just a cosmetic component, mm. comes with a lot of complexity, comes with certification, you know, comes with certain risks that if you use an off-the-shelf component has been already taken out. Um, and and then if you think about that, you know, over 200 parts are our, done by by us, um, this complexity is obviously is, well, mm. pretty immense. Yeah. 
How does your organization look like after you have realized that uh, you underestimated the complexity? Like, how do you try to build your company now, um, knowing that you know manufacturing and the supply chain of your your scooter will be way more complex than the first product? Um, yeah. So, so I mean, uh, the the organization, the way it has grown, is obviously we build a, very, a fairly large engineering team, so for uh, vehicle engineering um, as well as for embedded hardware software um, and so so the tech team is actually um, pretty big and this is combined with a smaller product team but that is basically giving the the tech team the direction um, and on the supply chain side we um, have part you know we have we have also obviously uh, um, grown um, but it's I think still fairly small, um, probably compared to, to other businesses, uh, because we outsource a lot of, or mo yeah, basically our manufacturing, um, and we have a strong partner there. Um, so we we also leverage, for example, their sourcing teams, and um, yeah, we have um, we're we're lucky that that now we're we're supported also by by our key suppliers, um, and and therefore don't have that big of an operations team, I would say. Mm -hmm. And I mean, one thing that like we we think about and also comes from the from the chat is kind of this the the complexities between the hardware and the software and where are the the biggest challenges. Um, I think that I don't know if I put you on the spot here, but you also um, are building an app for to control your um, new scooter, right? To share it with friends, uh, so do, you don't have a key, right? You basically say, "Hey, just take my scooter," even if I'm, I don't know, in uh, in Italy and my scooter is in Berlin. Mm -hmm. um, that's super cool. Like, how do you? What, what's the? Um, so I, I believe I, I looked at, at, at a YouTube video. So you basically have a um, a software that is controlling the. Um, uh, all of the basically the engines, and then you have an interface, and then you have like a IoT app somehow. Um, and how do you manage these three um, uh, development environments, so to say, including the the hardware components that are um, controlled by them? So, so the first thing is that we there is actually two electronics, uh, let's say. Um, circuits or, or architects mm -hmm. uh, architectures on this on the product the one is purely you know a dump scooter mm -hmm. um, so engine controller battery etc um, and that is where we leverage for example a lot of you know um, Bosch components and other supplier mm -hmm. components um, and where we program the driving behavior together with our partners um, but that that is yeah basically on, on that end um, mm -hmm. and this is as I said, a dumb scooter that drives ni nicely or well. Um, then the entire IoT part is on us, um, and it um, can inter like basically it can in with some you know interfaces also um, connect with the with the other part. For example, it can turn on the scooter or the engine or something like this. Um, but mainly, it runs completely um, separately, and and that is entirely developed both from the hardware as well as from the software side on our end. And that is where also the complexity is by far the biggest because the dump scooter part is something that is very similar to other partners, uh, other companies, and and also um, you know where not that much innovation has happened. But on the other, and um, basically we can control every single piece of this, this product. And in the future, you might be able, you know, when you're at the traffic light, light and you're listening to music over your phone, you maybe tap three times on the right break and and you skip to the next song and things like this you know like mm. everything is enabled by our own um, embedded um, hardware and software which is then connecting to our cloud platform um, and and is on the one hand side you know sending and receiving information from our cloud platform um, but also receiving the software updates from the mm. cloud platform and that cloud platform is connected then to your phone or it can be accessed to your phone um, and can therefore then, for example, display, you know, um, where's your scooter, what's the battery charge, um, or, you know, open the scooter. Um, but also this um, smart scooter part has its own um, direct connection to a phone, lock, so you can use Bluetooth Low Energy or NFC um, to um, even, un uh, you know, to open the scooter even if there's no internet connection, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Well, we have been uh, interviewing a lot of uh, hardware founders and they were, were having trouble to keep a balance between product design, engineering and marketing um, or go to market sales. How do you manage this? Like there must be a lot of like friction. I, I'd say I call it friction between the different teams that definitely like that they want to go in a different direction or be a little bit more extreme on the one side or the other. Um, like, how do you manage this as a hardware founder and CEO? Yeah. And what are yeah, the like, maybe takeaways here? Yeah? yeah, I think we had the same things, and I mean, some of the conflicts they are they are also very constructive and and they are very much needed. You know, because I mean, everyone in this company has a certain task, uh, and um, you know, like marketing wants to sell the scooter, so they come up with maybe features that customers would really buy the scooter for. Um, but technology uh, maybe has um, some some good reasons why this might not be possible or it's too expensive or um, not secure or something like that. And then um, in the earlier days, this was not, I think, well, well managed. Um, a lot went through us as through the co-founders, but without such a really structured process. Um, so it was more, you know, um, it was not managed, I think, um, very straightforward. Um, but then we've built more and more, you know, a strong product organization with product management managing this process and, and determining the priorities and basically listening to marketing and sales, to the service teams, uh, doing their own, you know, strategic research on, on, on competition and, and how the market is developing. But then you know, fully understanding also the technology aspects and then deciding, okay, these are actually the best that we want to do. Um, and this is why we go in that that priority, for example. And this has given also some pushback to the to the um, marketing and sales teams. For mm -hmm. example, um, you know, you, you know, mentioned that the app is now coming only. Uh, if it would have been to marketing and sales, the app would have been there before the scooter. Uh, <laughs> But, but we really focus on you know reliability, on power management, and on certain other uh, on other other priorities that we believe you know you really need to hit well uh, before you put more complexity um, into the product uh, and into the, the the user experience because we expect that if there's a tiny bug in the app since it's a vehicle you know people will reach out to our customer service and we have to be prepared for that. And, and we should only ship like an entire, you know, um, app experience that is really, really reliable um, and doesn't then cause, for example, as I said, a uh, high number of, of inbound. Nice. Uh, I have, we are already um, at our 30 minute limit. I have two questions uh, left. Um, one is, um, what would you tell hardware, st hardware founders uh, or people that want to start a hardware company uh, from your experience now. And uh, the second one is uh, a little bit going, like there was a question, uh, when, when do we have autonomous scooter driving, but maybe more in the direction of what is next for UNO? Like, how, like from, from the new scooter now, what is, what is next for, for the next uh, one or two years in terms of product development? Sure. Um, so on the first one, I think, uh, it's really or it's really good to to network uh, and get to know our hardware companies because a lot of the hardware companies face all the same challenges. However, they are not direct competitors. Mm -hmm. So this is something that actually has only I think been built in the last couple of years. When we started the company, it was not necessarily there, but there's organizations like, for example, the Hardware Club uh, from based in Paris, yeah. which. I think is a good source of inspiration also from other companies for young founders to see, okay, how do they do, I don't know, quality control in Asia? How do they um, deal with shipment problems here? How do they, you know, find the right tooling supplier, yada, 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 because they are not competing, uh, but they still have the same challenges. So I think networking and, and creating community here is, is really important. Mm -hmm. um, and um, on the question of what is next for us, so, um, so right now, I mean, we're f fully dedicated to the, the product that we launched, uh, you know, last year, um, and we're kind of learning a lot from the market how to iterate, make it even better. Um, so that is cur currently, you know, still the focus for this year, I would say. However, in the background, we're already preparing 
you know, what are the next steps outside of that space. So uh, we're looking into a faster scooter model um, since we're getting more and more demand also from South and European countries. Uh, but we're also looking into expanding more into lightweight um, e-bike category. Um, so that, that are the things that we're currently considering uh, to really leverage the direct business model that we have, the supply chain mm -hmm. that we have built, and the IoT technology, and and take it into further further verticals. Nice. I'm really excited about this. Pascal, thank you so much for taking the time. And if you uh, can make it, we start our networking session at uh, 6.15. would be amazing if you can join. Thanks Perfect. again and um, all the best. Thank you, Simon. Julia, there you are. What's next? Well, there you are. What's next? Wow, those were some fantastic insights from amazing founders and innovators. Thanks again, Christoph, Stefan and Pascal. In a few seconds, our second session will start with de-risking. So stay tuned. See you there.